evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to see so many of you, and I know that there are a significant number of people online, so this is a wonderful testament to the importance and um, pleasure we all attach to Caitlin's inaugural. It's great to see you all. My name's Charles French Constant. I'm the Faculty Pro Vice Chancellor for Medicine and Health Sciences here at UEA, and um, it really is good to see everyone. So our speaker today is Professor Caitlin Notley. So Caitlin is a social scientist working on addiction, the absolutely critically important topic for the health of our society. Her research experience spans clinical trials of complex behavioral interventions, systematic reviews and evidence synthesis, and in-depth qualitative approaches that really aim to get to the heart of the key questions around addiction and all of the challenges that it poses society. I think one thing I'd like to highlight, and this is a particular pleasure for me, is that Caitlin is a wonderful example of the grow your own philosophy of having real superstar professors at your university. So you did your undergraduate work here and then postgraduate work in what was then the School of Social Work and Psychosocial Science. I hope I got that right, yes. Um, and you climbed the ladder ever since to your current position of eminence. So your work, and I won't give your lecture for you, tempting though it is, um, your work, or much of your work, focuses on this really key issue of smoking and smoke addiction around smoking. And we know how important it is that, that children in particular I've been cut off, I think. Um, children in particular have a smoke-free environment, and so you're doing some wonderful work, which I imagine you'll tell us about, around the um, baby breathe postpartum smoking relapse uh, prevention intervention, and uh, work to develop smoke-free home interventions for families of babies admitted into neonatal intensive care and you're currently leading a major trial of smoking cessation for people attending hospital A&E departments. And you've also led the Cochrane Review, which of course are the key evidence-based syntheses that inform so much of our practice around smoking cessation, and you're co-author of one of the major sources of research evidence available on e-cigarettes, which is the Cochrane E-Cigarette Living Systematic Review. And to develop this work and to enable it to happen, you've developed a really wide range of national and international collaborators that we may hear more about. More about. But you've also, and, and for me this is really important as well, you have absolutely understood the importance of getting public, patients, families involved in research. And to this end, you and my predecessor, Dylan Edwards, came up with this amazing idea of the Citizens Academy, which brings the public and patients right into the heart of UEA research. It's a tremendous initiative. It's one of the jewels of the crown, one of the jewels of UEA's crown, in my opinion. And I, I applaud you for it. And I'm really looking forward to seeing it grow and develop some more. So with that, I'd like to say thank you and welcome to your inaugural. Um, well, thank you, Charles, for that really kind introduction. Um, uh, it's, it's so lovely to see everyone here. I'm so excited um, to see... that this doesn't show for you. Um, I'm so excited to see um, so many um, friends and colleagues and familiar faces. Um, and thank you all so much for making the effort um, to be here this evening. Um, it's really special to me um, to see you all in the audience. And welcome of all uh, as well to colleagues joining us um, online. Um, it's really fantastic that we're able to facilitate people to be here who aren't able to be here in person as well. So. If you're attending tonight hoping to hear about harm reduction and about addiction, you are going to get a little bit of that. Um, but also, this is an inaugural lecture, um, 
So it's a very highly personal um, kind of whistle-stop tour through my academic career. And I make no apologies. In fact, I take great delight in showing some personal photographs of my family just to embarrass them all. Um, <laughs> and to make the point about how central um, my family life and my home life have been to my academic and work working life too. So harm reduction, what is it? Well, when we talk about harm reduction in health terms, um, we mean a range of pragmatic policies, regulations and actions that either reduce um, health risks or encourage people to engage in less risky behaviours. So if, for example, we have harm reduction policies um, regulating behaviours that make everyday life safer. Um, we have laws on wearing seatbelts in cars, for example, to make driving cars safer. And within substance use, um, harm reduction may represent a range of policies, practices and guidance that help people who choose to engage in using um, drugs, for example, or drinking alcohol or smoking tobacco, engage in um, practices which are less risky to their short and long-term health. So really crucially, harm reduction um, is not about focusing on eradicating the behaviour um, completely or getting rid of, of products or particular behaviours. To my mind, harm reduction is a, a pragmatic approach. It's a humanist, person-centred approach, um, which generally acknowledges that some behaviours um, that humans tend to engage in may be risky, they may impact on long-term health, but what we need to do is support people to engage in um, behaviours that are less risky and less harmful to health. So I'm just going to give you a bit of a whistle-stop tour through um, my own research, which I think all of it um, can be encompassed within a, a harm reduction paradigm. Um, so these were the early days. Um, I started my degree here at UVA um, in 1997. Um, in that year, the School of Social Work um, became an entity in its own right, I believe, and was renamed the School of Work, um, Social Work and Psychosocial Sciences in the year 2000 when I graduated from my undergraduate degree. Um, I chose to take this degree um, after a year out. Um, it was quite a departure change from my initial decision to study drama in London, and I think that was 100% due to meeting my now husband, Marco, who, who changed my mind and thankfully changed my um, course and my career um, from there on in. So we were the first undergraduate cohort um, to study for the degree of psychosocial sciences. Um, and that was before the degree changed to a pure psychology degree and had BPS accreditation. And actually it's for that that I'm really, really grateful because I felt that the deg degree gave me a really good grounding in psychological theory, also social theory and aspects of, of sociology too. So it was really fundamentally influenced my thinking about addictive behaviour and has led to a much broader view, thinking about the multiple influences that impact on the expression of health behaviours. And I was inspired doing my undergraduate degree um, by a course I took on drug use and misuse led by Dr. Jan Keane at the time. So um, Dr. Keane, in her influential, or at least for me, um, book, wrote that the ancient Greek word for drug has three meanings, a cure or remedy, a poison, and a magical charm. And so the perspective in her book on illicit drugs was that drugs have different meanings in the modern sense. There's drugs as medication and as a solution to health problems. There's drugs as being dangerous and a threat to health. And there was drugs as um, being used for some magical or, or hedonistic reasons. And in the past, policy and practice within medicine were often based on a misunderstanding of the diversity and complexity of drug misusing behaviours. So professionals often confused different types of drug misuse and or, or attempted to compress drug misuse into kind of a dualism as, as either a good thing or a bad thing. And the um, harm reduction approach, I think, is really attempting to move away from thinking about that, that kind of dualistic approach to human behaviour. Um, so I did rather well in my degree, fortunately, and as we were the first cohort of graduates, I think I was rather fortunate at the time um, in securing a funded PhD studentship. Um, we had studentships available then, and I was, I was really, really lucky to secure that. Um, I was encouraged to apply for this, um, I remember at the time, by um, Dr David Shemmings, and I recall that he advised me that one of the key reasons for doing a PhD was being able to use the title doctor on your passport. And that might just place you in a position of being able to have an upgrade at an airport and perhaps go into first class. And I hope to say that's never happened to me, but I'm still waiting. <laughs> 
So I took David's advice um, and I embarked on my PhD with Dr. Jan Keane um, as my primary supervisor. However, sadly, she left for Pastors New quite quickly in my first year. And I was then delighted to be supervised by Professor David Howe, and I'm really delighted to see him in the audience this evening. So Professor Howe is an international expert in social work theory, particularly in attachment theory, um, as an explanatory um, framework for, for behaviour. And I'm really grateful to David for his insights that have been very influential in my thinking um, around addictive behaviours, particularly theorising the individual as being in relationship um, in the early days with a primary caregiver and then throughout um, life with significant others. And this is absolutely fundamental when we think about um, the impact that relationships have on health behaviours such as substance use. I'm also really thankful to David for being quite a hands-off supervisor. He was there when I needed him and, and was a fantastic guide, um, but also gave me absolute academic freedom to fully explore and learn about my own chosen topic. So in this time, I was interested in talking to people who used drugs. Um, I was really um, interested to know, hear their stories and hear about their relationships and began to explore notions around um, the social group, group and subcultures. So particularly interested and fascinated really in how alternative movements in society kind of break away from the mainstream. Um, and then, and then behaviours within those groups are supported and perpetuated um, by engaging in the social group. And that may be um, a force for good um, in terms of um, protecting each other within the social group, but also potentially could lead people into more public problematic behaviours and perhaps be a force for less good. Um, so, if I can just move on. Here I am um, with, uh, on my graduation day um, with my parents and um, a young uh, baby Matilda um, in my arms. Don't we all look young? This was 20 years ago. <laughs> so what did my PhD teach me about harm reduction? So in undertaking my diligent literature review in my, my first year of being a PhD student, I was very influenced by the work of Zinberg. Zinberg was a psychiatrist um, at Harvard Medical School who really for the first time theorised how individual substance using behaviour was influenced in equal measure and also in interaction um, by three core factors. So that's aspects related to the drug, for example, the pharmacology of the substance used, the amount and type of substance being used, um, aspects of the set, and by that, mean I, uh, by that I mean that the psychological makeup and experiential um, experiences that individuals go through, and then aspects of the setting. So by this I mean the social group, um, uh, small groups and wider groups, and also the culture that people are um, involved in. So um, I was heavily influenced also at this time by some of the pragmatic writings on harm reduction. Soon after the HIV antibody um, test was introduced in 90, 1985, there was a very high prevalence of HIV um, infection, which had been identified in some groups of um, Scottish heroin users. And at the time, the Advisory Council on the Misuse of Drugs concluded that the spread of HIV is a greater danger to individual and public health than drug misuse itself. We must therefore work with those who continue to misuse drugs to help them to reduce the risks involved in that drug use. Um, and above all, to help them um, reduce the risk of acquiring and spreading the HIV infection. So this report from the Advisory Council on the Misuse of Drugs at the time was a really key step along the road to the development of harm reduction as a really distinct area of professional practice. So Jerry Stimson, um, an esteemed colleague, described um, what was seen as a new paradigm for those working in the drugs field that focused on the prevention of drug harms rather than on the prevention of um, the behaviour of drug use itself. And this has really had a significant impact on drug policy and practice um, uh, for the last 20 or 30 years. We saw the expansion of needle exchange programmes and methadone treatment, for example. And this movement has gone on now to have a profound influence in the field of tobacco harm reduction, which is where most of my research has been focused. So after completing the early phases of my PhD, I had what I thought was a novel research question. I was interested to try and explore and maybe even explain why some people seem to be able to manage and be in control of their drug use, um, which you might call non-problematic in terms of its impact on their functioning 
their health and other areas of their life. But other people seemed to lack this control and found themselves in a cycle of um, increasingly problematic and harmful substance use. So as I, as I said, my interest was in understanding um, the world through the stories that people told me, through the experiences of people themselves, and in collecting qualitative data, so listening carefully to people's stories, being curious about people's lives and understanding their relationships. So I set out to interview adults who um, told me they were using illicit drugs. And as a result of this, I was able to use an analysis technique known as grounded theory, where we work with words as data to theorise an explanatory framework for how some people manage to remain in control of their substance use. And here it is. Um, it's with some trepidation that I'm showing this to you tonight. I have to say, I, I don't think I've actually opened my thesis for 20 years since I completed it. And I feel rather embarrassed actually looking about, back at my early attempts at developing theory. It's a bit like looking at um, childhood school photos. Um, but I actually think, um, looking back on it, um, it gives quite a good framework for perhaps where my work um, has led to. The basic idea was that people embark on experiences using different substances as a form of experimentation probably um, during the teenage years. And these experiences are usually undertaken um, in social groups within social settings. Often these experiences are really positive and have a cementing effect within social groups. But really interesting, interestingly, I found that um, people who use drugs had very clear rules, socially negotiated rules, about what is and what isn't acceptable behaviour. So people who talked about using recreational cannabis, for example, might have very clear rules and boundaries about not using Class A drugs. Or people that used Class A drugs might have very cl clear rules about the way they used them, only ingesting them orally and never injecting, for example. So these rules were agreed within a social group and shared, maybe not spoken, but there was a shared understanding about boundaries um, and role models were also important within these social groups. So people told stories like horror stories of, of folklore of things that had happened to other people in other groups. And that seemed to act as a, um, something that I called uh, the, the um, shared negative buffer. It seemed to act as a kind of socially agreed way in which people were kept safe and avoided progression um, to more pro problematic forms of drug use. And so my early attempts at developing theory um, were clearly about trying to understand and theorise the role of social influence um, as, as a key part of harm reduction as I, I now see it. So I was fortunate um, to complete and submit my thesis on time within three years. And I was really motivated to finish on time because I was pregnant with my first child, Matilda. And the looming due date really coincided with the date of handing in the thesis, which actually was, was really positive for me. So I managed to submit on time. And becoming a parent was obviously a, a game changer. You know, it turned our worlds upside down in a very positive way and really helped us to help me and my husband um, to think about how important, um, you know, other people and relationships are in, in life. Um, and it was really advantageous, especially, I think, to have completed my thesis just before Matilda was born, um, and then to be accompanied to my oral viva by a newborn baby, um, <laughs> which I think was really helpful, and it all went really well on the day, thankfully without too many tears from either myself or Matilda, <laughs> which didn't happen at our wedding, I have to say. <laughs> So it wasn't until some years later, after a period of maternity leave, which I really, really enjoyed, that I was finally able to publish my first, first author paper as a result of my PhD studies. I am, I, uh, this also I feel sort of slightly <coughs> embarrassed about, and I have to say I haven't even read it in preparing for this talk because that feeling of embarrassment was so strong. But I was pleased to have my first paper published. Um, it was a rather kind of clumsy attempt to think about different groups of, of substance users within our community. I'm not sure if I would agree with that approach now. I kind of tried to steer away from typologies and, and putting people into groups. But there you go. Um, I was really, really proud to have my first paper published. Um, and then <laughs> along came Edgar. So this was um, really, again, another fantastic event in our lives. Um, our son kind of came into the world roaring um, and has been, you know, such a, a joyous um, person to have in our lives and made such a difference um, to our lives and our family. 
So it was uh, the, the birth of Edgar and me, me being on a second maternity leave that also saw the end of one of my research contracts. And while on maternity leave, um, I applied for a position within the Norwich Medical School. And I think that was a good move. <laughs> so I started a post in the medical school then um, in 2006. And at this point, um, I first met Professor Richard Holland, um, who has since become a really valued mentor um, and someone that I owe a great deal to for, for supporting me, particularly in, in my early career. So then a senior lecturer, um, Professor Holland, had an idea for a trial, and I remember the conversation about this idea. And so I became initiated um, into the world of the randomised controlled trial. I didn't really know anything about trials before that point. The concept with the trial was quite simple. So the practice of supervised consumption um, involves um, requiring people who are in treatment for their opiate addiction to attend community pharmacies to be watched taking their prescribed methadone um, medication. Um, and this practice had arisen really in response to the growing availability of prescribed methadone on the black market. So clearly people were um, selling their, their um, methadone and, and buying other things with the money they made but also as a harm reduction approach, um, a way of trying to keep street heroin users in treatment and keep them safer. It was about trying to keep people as safe as possible, ensuring that they had some contact with a healthcare provider um, and were at least seen regularly and checked in on. Um, we had a Labour government at the time, I recall, and I think this was um, quite helpful in terms of the primary outcome of the trial, which was about retaining people in treatment um, with the assumption that people in treatment were less um, at risk of harm and safer. So um, the assumption really was that while people were being um, supervised taking their prescribed me medication, they were also much less likely to engage in the most chaotic and, and harmful forms of substance misuse, um, such as injecting or sharing needles. So we set out to test through the trial, led by um, Professor Holland, um, whether supervision really worked as a practice in retaining drug users in treatment, or did it, conversely, as was the fear, um, take away people's liberty um, and privacy and push people away from treatment um, even further. So this was really a pivotal trial. It was the first ever trial of supervised consumption, an important study um, to provide some evidence of the effectiveness and cost effectiveness of this approach of um, supervision. But the trial was itself, sadly, um, inconclusive. We didn't find a difference in retention in treatment um, for those who were supervised versus those who were unsupervised um, taking their medication. But this was a complex, real-world trial. So all sorts of things happened um, when, when we were trying to run the trial. Sometimes clinicians swapped individuals between um, groups, um, so they would go become, um, start being supervised and then move to unsupervised treatment despite the, the trial design. Sometimes um, the people in the unsupervised group um, started turning up every day at the pharmacy because they actually quite liked attending the pharmacy and having a chat with the pharmacist. So they were, in effect, engaging in the active treatment of supervision themselves, despite their randomised group. So it was a really difficult trial to run and um, a difficult client group, but a really interesting client group to work with. And so the qualitative work that I was lucky enough to be asked by Richard um, to lead um, became really important alongside the trial. And this is one of the major threads, I think, throughout all of my work, the importance of listening to research participants, understanding their perspectives, the nuance, digging deeper to try and explore what's really going on within that confines of, of the randomised controlled trial, looking at social and cultural influences and think about how they're operating alongside the intervention that's being tested in the trial. And what we found in the qualitative work was that supervised consumption was actually quite well accepted by patients. It didn't take away their privacy, as we had thought. Um, it did cause some practical limitations, um, and there were issues, some issues of privacy and stigma. But many of the patients in the trial told us that they actually quite liked the daily routine of being required to attend the pharmacy. Many of these people had had extremely um, chaotic lives and having that sense of structure imposed on their lives was actually quite positive and, and beneficial. And really importantly, sadly maybe, participants reported that they started to form relationships with pharmacists who perhaps were the only people in their lives that actually asked them how they were and took an interest in their well-being. So it was the only po sort of kind of positive connection that many people had 
outside the more chaotic world um, of using illicit drugs. So surprisingly, um, in the qualitative study, we found that supervision was, was quite accepted. Um, but clearly having flexibility to move away from being supervised was also important to patients who over time, when they were doing well in treatment, kind of appreciated the freedom and the sense of trust of moving to unsupervised treatment regimes. So this study provided an important patient perspective and it was the first in-depth qualitative study to really ask people what, what it felt like for them to be um, supervised taking their medications. So to me, a really important study. And then, during my time working on the Super C trial, um, we welcomed our third child, Eloise, um, into the world. Um, and I get, again took a period of maternity leave from work. I see that she's very embarrassed at the front, which is... <laughs> um, and I returned um, a year later um, to a, a new role. So this is when um, I, my interest, particularly in tobacco smoking relapse prevention, um, first started. So my lovely colleagues, um, Annie and Viv, were working on the Sharpish trial at the time, which was a trial of a self-help intervention, so a series of booklets, basically, led by Professor Fujian Song, based here at UEA, um, testing an intervention, the self-help intervention, developed by Professor Tom Brandon um, of the Moffitt Cancer Research Centre in, in Florida, USA. Um, so they'd had some success in the States um, with this self-help approach to, to helping people stay um, free um, from smoking. But as, all, as, as always, um, things that work in America don't always translate well into the UK context. So we, we sought to test whether this approach would work within um, a randomised controlled trial. And the idea was that we recruited people um, who'd been able to stop smoking and the intervention was really about um, supporting them to stay smoke free in the long term. So again, um, this trial didn't find a benefit of the intervention. <laughs> There's a bit of a theme emerging here. Um, and in fact, relapse rates were remarkably similar um, between those who had been randomised to the intervention versus the, the control arm of the trial. So again, it became really clear to me the value of mixed methods approaches. I led the qualitative work alongside this trial, and that really importantly demonstrated, um, I guess, people's lack of engagement with the, the self-help intervention um, ultimately. We heard from people that some people couldn't read the booklets, you know, some people had literacy problems, they weren't able to engage with this type of intervention, for example. So the qualitative work was really helpful in, in helping us to understand why the, that intervention might not have worked um, as we perhaps would have hoped. So why study relapse? Well, I think it's important just to take a little step back now to think a bit more carefully about why we felt and why I still feel that it's so crucially important to study um, relapse. And this is because if we want to sustain the health benefits for smokers of managing to quit smoking, then we need to um, support them to sustain that quit and stay stopped from smoking. Most current smokers, if you ask them, will tell you that they want to quit smoking. And when asked, about half of all smokers say that they've tried to quit smoking in the 12 months um, before being asked. But it's a really, really powerful um, addiction to nicotine and very different, difficult addiction to overcome. So, unfortunately, many um, smoking quit attempts fail, and relapse to smoking after either um, a supported or an unsupported quit attempt is really common. So the relapse curve shown here on the left demonstrates that in clinical samples, most smoking relapse um, occurs really shortly after quitting, and then there's decreasing probability um, over time of relapse um, the longer a person remains abstinent. So in this study, the relapse curves um, reported by Hughes here, it's rather depressingly concluded that for any given quit attempt among people who don't have help with that quit attempt, the long-term abstinence rate appears to be between 3 and 5%. So although many people manage to quit smoking, most people relapse. And this suggests in simple terms, most, most quit attempts by smokers will fail and most will result in relapse. Um, and the forest plot on the left shows some interventions that have been tested in clinical trials to support relapse, um, and it really is quite inconclusive in its evidence. It shows that um, attempts to intervene and prevent relapse have been largely unsuccessful, as this um, forest plot from the Cochrane Review um, shows. Um, it demonstrates quite mixed findings of study, no clear benefit of any particular approach, 
although possibly some small indication that um, extending people's pharmacological treatment for smoking cessation, so nicotine replacement therapy, might help them to stay quit from smoking. But really importantly, none of these relapse prevention um, trials included here um, included e-cigarettes as part of the intervention. Um, and why study tobacco smoking? Well, by way of background, smoking is the leading preventable cause of death and disease in the UK. About half of all lifelong smokers will die prematurely. Um, and smokers who continue to smoke throughout life will lose on average 10 years of life. So people who smoke tobacco will die 10 years earlier than people who don't smoke at all. And most of that smoking-related death is due to lung cancer, um, COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, I shouldn't have tried to say that, um, and coronary heart disease. And smoking doesn't in just impact on the individual smoker. So secondhand smoke exposure also has direct, direct impacts on poor health outcomes. So smoking is a social behaviour, it's a relational behaviour that is often initiated um, within a, so a social group. That activity is social, but the health behaviour itself also impacts on others in the immediate social setting in terms of the person who smokes and contributes to harm of, of others as well as the smoker themselves. So really positively, um, in England, um, in recent years, we've seen levels of tobacco smoking decline year on year. Currently, our population levels of tobacco smoking prevalence um, are estimated to be just less than 15% of the general population. But that's still more than one in 10 adults in our population who are regular tobacco as a smoker, despite um, very widespread awareness of the harms. But those um, statistics hide really huge inequalities. So... In particular groups of people, particularly those groups who have very complex psychological and social needs, such as people who are experiencing homelessness, people with severe mental illness, people using other substances, and people involved in the criminal justice system, we see that over 75% of those populations are regular tobacco smokers. So clearly there's something about tobacco smoking interacting um, with other issues um, in people's lives. So 78% of the homeless population, it's estimated, although in our trial we think it's possibly quite a lot more than that, um, smoke tobacco compared to just less than 15% of the, the general population. There's a huge health inequality here. So when I started to become interested in the addictive behaviour of tobacco smoking and thinking about how we can help prevent relapse, um, it was really clear from a harm um, reduction perspective that here is an area of addictive behaviour where research clearly stands to make an enormous difference in minimising the burden of disease and death as a result of the behaviour of tobacco smoking. In the UK, around 200 people die every single day from a smoking-related condition. And if we can make just a small difference in helping people stay smoke-free, we can impact on those figures. Um, so, really importantly, and just to be completely clear about this, the harm from tobacco smoking um, is caused by the inhalation of combusted tobacco smoke. It is the smoke that causes the harm. And we've known this for quite a long time. Um, it was Professor Mike Russell in 1979 who first suggested that smokers smoke for the nicotine that they become dependent on, but they die from the tar that they're inhaling into their lungs. Cigarette smoke contains over 4,000 different chemicals, and 69 of those chemicals are known to be carcinogenic. So that means that they are directly linked to causing um, cell changes within the body that go on to cause different types of cancers. So there are 500 different gases in cigarette smoke, um, poisonous gases such as carbon monoxide, ammonia and formaldehyde, and approximately 3,500 different particulates. So these are tiny particles that can cause um, real harm to the, the human body. Tobacco nitro nitrosamines, for example, are one of the most important groups of carcinogens um, in tobacco products. Um, and they are present in the tobacco itself, and particularly in the smoke that um, is caused when we light the tobacco. So nicotine itself is also a particulate, and is of course the substance that users become dependent on. But it's not the nicotine itself that's harmful to health but the other constituents of the tobacco smoke. And that's really important to remember when we think about harm reduction approaches. 
So I was really swayed and taken by the urgency of addressing the harm, addressing the harm of tobacco smoking. Um, and I set about to secure funding in the field to try um, and pursue this. So the obvious way to do this as a, a jobbing um, postdoc researcher is to apply for a, a postdoctoral fellowship. But it's really, really competitive to apply for fellowships. And um, within medicine, you're up against all the other clinical specialisms. I can't help feeling um, that there's perhaps a bias in funding towards discovery and treatment rather than public health-focused work. So I experienced, not for the first time in my career, disappointment and rejection again and again and again. <laughs> um, I was really inspired, actually, um, a couple of years ago, and in thinking about this talk, in um, uh, some academics have published um, what we call a CV of failures. And I dipped in and out of this concept um, in preparing this talk, but in the end I just ran out of energy to list all the papers that had been rejected, um, all the grants that we haven't won, so I'm just giving you a, a small overview of some of the disappointment, which is actually like one of the key um, aspects of academic life. Um, but another key aspect of academic life um, is bouncing back and being really resilient. Um, and so eventually I was successful in being awarded a fellowship. Um, it was actually the first fellowship awarded by the Society for the Study of Addiction. And I'm really forever grateful to them for their um, support and investment um, in me at this stage of my career. And then another possible influential factor about being awarded that fellowship is that I was again pregnant. <laughs> I remember really clearly um, a warm summer's day when I travelled to London for my fellowship interview panel accompanied by my husband Marco who was there just in case I went into labour because my due date was literally a, a few days um, in advance. I um, presented my ideas and then took part in a panel interview at the Tavistock Clinic in London while Marco very patiently waited outside in the park checking I was okay. Um, and I was fortunate to be um, awarded that fellowship. So began my fourth and, and final period of maternity leave. It was a, a very special time um, where our baby Coco um, was really treasured and I really enjoyed that time in my life, knowing for sure that that was going to be my last period of maternity leave. And I can say that for sure. <laughs> and so when I returned from maternity leave, I began my fellowship and my research focused through the fellowship, particularly on smoking relapse prevention. Also, I clearly had an interest in pregnancy in the postpartum period. So I brought those two interests together um, and tried to think about how we could prevent women who'd managed to quit smoking during pregnancy from relapsing back to smoking after they'd had the baby. So this is a really, really important problem between 75 and 90% of women that quit smoking for pregnancy relapse in the first year after they've had their baby. And there's really important social um, factors that might impact on this. So having a partner who smokes or being involved, uh, living in a family where smoking is the norm are really strong predictors for women of relapsing back to smoking. So we kind of thought, I started to think about, you know, there were self-help approaches, but we knew that that hadn't really worked with the Sharpish trial. And then again, looking at the Cochrane review of interventions for postpartum relapse prevention, we saw kind of mixed effects and interventions that nothing really ha had worked. Nothing had helped women to stay smoke-free. So could a self-help approach help, or, or did we need something else? And that's what I set out to try and... Um, look at through my um, postdoctoral fellowship, trying to develop interventions that might um, identify with women and, and deal with aspects of a smoking relapse that other interventions so far hadn't um, managed to deal with. So firstly, I synthesised all the available qualitative evidence um, that we had available at the time, helping to understand why women might relapse back to smoking. And the, relapse for, um, the reasons for relapse were really complex and brought me back to my um, undergraduate degree in, in, in psychosocial sciences because the, the reasons really spanned physical, psychological, social, cultural and also identity related reasons. So physiologically, women talked about changes to their bodies um, immediately after they'd given birth, almost immediate returns of cravings for nicotine, even though they'd managed to stay smoke free throughout pregnancy. And breastfeeding um, was really strongly correlated with staying smoke-free. So many women um, who chose not to breastfeed were much more at risk of going back to smoking. Psychologically, women had mistaken beliefs about how invulnerable they were to smoking relapse. Many women who quit smoking during pregnancy believed they didn't need support and that they would be able to maintain the quit. Socially, I've talked about how strong the influence of having a, a partner or a, a 
household where smoking is the norm impacts on women's um, behaviour. And also culturally, so norms around smoking in particular social groups were really strong. For some communities, smoking continued to be the norm and there was an expectation that women would go back to smoking after pregnancy. So a real um, range of complex reasons, and particularly this is where my interest in identity um, really stems from, because women talked about their identity um, as they became a mother as being you know, a fundamental change in their lives. And for some women, this was a really difficult um, change to kind of come to terms with. So for some women in the postpartum period, relapsing back to smoking was almost like a way of regaining their sense of themselves um, before they had become a mother. You know, connecting again with a social group, going out, being young, free and single, um, and smoking was a part of that for, for some women. And I was also really excited at, at this time to get this work published in the journal Addiction. So this is the leading um, uh, international journal on publishing nicotine and tobacco and addiction science. And I remember saying at my fellowship interview that my main ambition for the fellowship was to have an article published in Addiction, which I'd tried and failed to do many times before, so I was really excited to, to finally get an article published. And during the time of my fellowship, something really exciting happened for the field of, of tobacco um, research. And that is that e-cigarettes became to be widely used by smokers um, in the UK as a way of quitting smoking. So e-cigarettes, when they first emerged, were, were, were called a disruptive technology. This was a, a term coined by Carl Fagerstrom, a famous nicotine um, and tobacco researcher in 2015. And they were disruptive because they were a consumer product. They weren't a medicinal product um, aimed to treat smoking cessation. They were something that had arisen as a consumer product, and people were using them, and people were stopping smoking. So this almost seemed like you know, a, a miracle cure. They also seemed to appeal to whole groups of people who had never before tried to stop smoking or didn't even want to stop smoking. People were using e-cigarettes and finding that they quite liked them and they were really effective um, in helping them stop smoking. So e-cigarettes offered a rapid form of nicotine delivery which mimicked quite well um, tobacco um, smoking in a way that other nicotine replacement products couldn't mimic that um, nicotine delivery. But really critically, they also mimicked tobacco cigarettes um, for other aspects. So in terms of the behavioural action that smokers came to become so dependent on, the social element of smoking, and possibly um, we fe I, I felt um, e-cigarettes could meet an identity need. So they helped people engage with a social group and take on a new identity <coughs> as a vapour, moving away from their previous identity as a smoker. So the positioning of e-cigarettes is that they are a reduced harm way of continuing to use nicotine. This is a product that allows people to continue to use nicotine but cut out the combustible um, tobacco smoke which is so harmful to health. So on this harm continuum diagram here, um, you can see that the most harmful way of consuming nicotine is at the far left and that's um, smoking um, cigarettes. And then to the right um, of the um, diagram are the least or less harmful way of using nicotine. So these are non-combustible tobacco products, including e-cigarettes and prescribed nicotine replacement therapy. And somewhere in the middle might be um, tobacco products which aren't combusted, so chewing tobacco and, and snus, for example, um, not really used so much in the UK, but used abroad. Um, so I can't take credit for this image, but this has become really um, a commonly used image in the field. Um, demonstrating the harm continuum um, of tobacco um, and nicotine-containing products. Um, and alongside this understanding of a, a harm continuum, there was um, started to become a consensus statement from the Royal Colleges, from Public Health England, key funders such as Cancer Research UK, giving clear messaging to the public that e-cigarettes could offer a reduced harm way um, for smokers who were wishing to quit smoking tobacco but were unwilling or unable to give up using nicotine. So following those early consensus statements, we now have really clear evidence, and this is reviewed annually by Public Health England, or now the Office for Health Improvement and Disparities, um, who conclude that vaping poses only a small fraction of the risks of smoking. So no one is saying that vaping is a, a completely harm-free um, way of quitting smoking, but certainly much less harmful than smoking tobacco itself. Um, so it's fortuitous um, that I think that I was able to attend the first ever research consensus and priority setting workshop um, hosted by all the major health research funders back in 2015. 
and uh, it was there that I first met Professor Lynn Dawkins, um, who's a highly respected leader in nicotine and tobacco research um, and has become a trusted friend and colleague. Um, and it was at one of these workshops that we came up with the idea for my first research funding um, in the field of e-cigarette research. Um, we sketched it out, as I recall, pretty much on the back of an envelope, an idea for a qualitative project, project exploring user um, experience of it, experiences of e-cigarette use. And so the e-cigarette trajectories um, project came to fruition. And this was a really project, important project for me and for the field, um, pivotal really, in bringing together my interest in tobacco harm reduction and e-cigarettes alongside preventing um, smoking relapse. So the idea was quite simple. Um, our hypothesis was that e-cigarettes offered a potentially important intervention to help ex-smokers um, stay smoke-free to prevent relapse. But no one had actually asked e-cigarette users themselves or vapors um, about their patterns of behavior. And this was vital really in helping us to understand how best to promote and support people to switch to vaping away from tobacco, which devices they should use, which patterns they might be best to, to adopt um, and so on. Um, and it was also in this project that I first met Dr. Emma Ward, my first um, research associate, um, who's still um, a really key, important part of our um, addictions research group today um, and really valued um, colleague um, too. So one of Emma's particular skills is visualising qualitative research. I'm not going to go through this because I'm aware it's a bit small and I'm sorry for that, but I have to thank Emma um, for this graphic. What we attempted to do was track trajectories through quitting smoking and using e-cigarettes. So through qualitative interviews, we heard that most smokers um, had self-reported long histories of tobacco use, multiple previous quit attempts, and they'd eventually relapse back to smoking um, before they tried an e-cigarette. So when they first tried an e-cigarette, many of the users told us that they experienced it as really quite revelationary. They were quickly able to fully switch away from tobacco um, and start to use e-cigarettes as an alternative. For some, that was the case. For others, periods of dual use, vaping alongside tobacco smoking um, were combined um, and their initial attempts at vaping were quite unsatisfactory. Many users first chose kind of the cheaper cigar-like type products which weren't really adequate before switching um, to a better um, forms of nicotine delivery through the, some of the kind of new um, e-cigarettes that are available on the market now. So experimentation with different devices, um, different flavours, different setups, different nicotine strengths resulted for some people in kind of a, a gradual sliding towards um, quitting smoking rather than that, than that instantaneous switch. And for some people that's a really important um, pattern of being able to quit smoking that e-cigarettes have, have really enabled. So the Exceptra um, study was, was amazing, really. Um, it was a really small-scale study funded by Cancer Research UK, <laughs> but it generated so many outputs. Um, so academic papers, um, where we reported on our, our qualitative findings, but it also really kick-started my first forays into science communication. So um, Emma and I filmed YouTube videos um, at the time, trying to debunk the myths um, that the media seemed to be keen on perpetuating about the... The, the desperate harms of, of vaping. Um, so we tried to give a balanced evidence-based view to kind of um, deal with some of those myths um, and, and give it a more balanced view. Um, we also developed um, some materials for smokers, giving advice on the best ways and patterns to um, switch to e-cigarettes that might help them stay smoke-free long-term. Um, and we still see these resources um, in use within Stop Smoking Services now, so we're, we're really proud to have made a difference um, in helping people stay smoke free. And also alongside e-cigarette use, I continued my fellowship focusing on, on postpartum relapse pre prevention. So this led to me being awarded my first major national funding through the Medical Research Council, and we were tasked with developing a relapse prevention intervention. So again, we used mixed methods, um, reviewing the evidence available at the time, qualitative methods, talking to women who'd managed to stay smoke free and those who'd relapsed, and also their partners, um, trying to understand what would best help um, women to stay smoke-free in the long term. So a really person-centred approach to intervention development. Um, again, we were able to widely disseminate the findings of this um, intervention development study. Um, and this led to the development of, of the baby breathe intervention that, that Charles mentioned in his introduction. So this is a, a complex intervention. Um, crucially, it's working with health visitors who form relationships with women in the postpartum period to support them to stay um, smoke-free um, after they've had their baby. The intervention is based on the evidence we gathered from women during our earlier press study 
And it includes um, that face-to-face -face support, but also access to digital and remote resources that really um, are important for some people. And really critically as well includes the provision of nicotine replacement therapy and advice to use e-cigarettes as a harm reduction alternative if women are experiencing cravings to return to smoking um, in the postpartum period. So a complex intervention with, with many different aspects. Um, that we went, then went on to secure funding um, for the largest ever um, trial internationally of a relapse prevention intervention. This is testing the Baby Breathe package of support. And I'm so lucky to work with such a fantastic team on this trial, um, which is hosted by the Clinical Trials Unit um, here at UEA. Um, we've been really um, delighted um, <laughs> to be able to um, run this study. Um, we're still recruiting now. Um, and we hope that it will provide um, definitive evidence, really, about um, recommendations we might make in supporting women to stay smoke-free um, after their pregnancies. And in another fortuitous event, um, as I recall, it was early conversations with my colleague, Professor Paul Clark, um, and the neonatal research nurse and my very good friend, Amy Nichols, about smoking prevalence of babies um, admitted, of parents of babies admitted to neonatal intensive care units that led um, to a further study, um, we called it at the time the Nessie study, um, where we aimed to develop um, a very targeted intervention for families of, uh, of babies admitted to neonatal intensive care, helping them um, to quit smoking and of course then to stay smoke free and avoid relapse. So really, um, shockingly, there's no support available for families um, of babies in neonatal intensive care units at the moment, but rates of smoking for that population are really high. Perhaps not surprisingly, tobacco smoking is one of the leading causes of, of premature um, and preterm birth. And we found that about 30% of the families um, in the NICU here in the Nor at the Norfolk and Norwich were um, still smoking tobacco um, during the time of their baby's admission. So this is a really important um, study where we've developed an intervention, again, looking at the available evidence and taking a qualitative approach. Um, we interviewed parents of babies on the neonatal intensive care unit. They told us what sort of support they, were ne they needed. They told us they really wanted to quit smoking and they really wanted, didn't know how to do it and needed support. So that's what we're aiming to do through this intervention. Um, the intervention itself is completely amazing. I was going to show you at one of the virtual reality videos that we've developed, but I, I wasn't daring enough to um, deal with the tech. But we're taking it, we've used virtual reality um, to tr really try and um, demonstrate to families the impact of tobacco smoke on very, very vulnerable and premature infants. And the intervention, of, of course, also includes um, support for parents to stop smoking and the offer of an e-cigarette to help promote switching away from tobacco if people are unwilling to um, quit nicotine. So we hope to move towards definitive testing of this intervention as the next step. So I've been really fortunate in the last few years to work with the Cochrane Tobacco Group. Um, this is an amazing group um, to work with. Cochrane Reviews are trusted sources of healthcare evidence. There are also huge amounts of work. Um, I've been lucky enough to lead the review of incentives for smoking cessation and now involved in the e-cigarettes um, living review. So this is a review where we update the evidence every month and we regularly publish that evidence because it's such a fast emerging field. And it's led to some really fun projects, so podcasts um, and public engagement um, to talk about the benefits of e-cigarettes for quitting smoking and staying smoke free. So it's really as a result of my work with the Cochrane Tobacco Group um, that my, and my growing interest in e-cigarettes um, that I became involved in, in really trying to promote um, the scientific understanding around um, e-cigarettes. Um, and so why, why is this so important? Well, public perceptions have a huge impact on health behaviour. People believe what they read in the media and the media should really be held accountable um, for this, in my view. So when people read stories um, like this um, and like this, it really impacts on their behaviour, which ultimately um, causes them to continue to smoke tobacco. So um, I was really motivated to try and address some of this um, misunderstanding in the media and give evidence-based information in response based on um, the evidence um, giving messages um, from Public Health England and, and Cancer Research UK, um, such as this. So. In trying to address some of the kind of media misperceptions, um, I've been taken on a, an exciting journey which has involved TV um, interviews, um, engaging with the public through, through 
kind of public facing articles based on the evidence and also responding um, to uh, uh, newspaper misreporting about the potential harms of vaping. So it's always, it's, it's amazing to me that people still talk about a phenomenon known as popcorn lung. This is a story that came out of America nearly 10 years ago, which was actually about a series of, of isolated um, cases um, due directly to people adult, um, vaping adulterated um, THC containing liquids with a carrier called vitamin E acetate, which is a substance banned um, in regulated e-liquids available here in the UK. So although that story had nothing at all to do with regular um, nicotine vaping, people still talk about it and it really impacts on their um, behaviour. And that's why it's so important, I think, to try and communicate the science in, in an evidence way and try and redress the balance so that people can engage with less harmful behaviours. And it was in fact partly as a, a result of media speculation about e-cigarettes as potentially maintaining people's um, addiction to tobacco smoking that we first conceived of the Traject study. So funded by Cancer Research UK, working with my co-PI, Professor Felix Norton, um, this has been an amazing study um, exploring patterns and trajectories of dual-use behaviour. I don't know how it's going, sorry. Um, and I really have to thank um, Dr Emma Ward, um, and I know Felix will join me in, in thanking her for really pretty much single-handedly managing um, this study. Um, we recruited a small selected sample of people who were dual-using both tobacco and e-cigarettes, monitored them daily um, for 90 days, and people reported back to us via their mobile, mobile phones on their um, kind of daily smoking and vaping behaviour. And we also objectively monitored their vaping behaviour using a little device that, that fits to the end of the e-cigarette and, and told us about their puffing patterns while they were vaping. So here's just a quick snapshot of some of the data in this study. You can see in the graph on the left um, someone reporting their smoking behaviour in blue in terms of the number of cigarettes they were smoking every day. And then the objective measure in their reporting of their vaping behaviour is the line in orange. So you can see a, a clear point in time where this person manages to stop using tobacco almost completely and, and switch to vaping. Um, and really importantly, the qualitative research alongside this quantitative data collection is, has been incredibly illuminating. So this person told us that they made a conscious effort um, to cut right down. And it was really around the time that they bought a much more satisfying device and started making their own e-liquids that they were able to find something that really worked for them and switch away from smoking tobacco. It's a really powerful study. Um, so to current work and where are we now? Well, we're galvanised as a field um, to striving towards the UK government's target of reaching a smoke-free 2030. Um, that's an incredibly ambitious target. If we think in real terms, this means reaching a, a population level prevalence of smoking of 5% or less, then, then perhaps it's possible. But if you think back to the slide I showed earlier on inequalities, there's clearly a huge, huge um, way to go um, with some vulnerable populations in particular, where rates of tobacco smoking still remain stubbornly um, incredibly high. So clearly we need innovative um, new approaches delivered in creative ways. Um, so currently I'm really honoured to work with wonderful colleagues, um, particularly Dr Ian Pope and the team here in the Knowledge Clinical Trials Unit, delivering a trial that offers opportunistic smoking cessation support for people attending a hospital emergency department for whatever reason. That support includes the offer of an e-cigarette starter kit and behavioural support to continue to use it. And then also really honoured to be involved in the SKETCH trial, smoking cessation um, trial for centres um, in centres for the homeless. Um, this is a trial led by um, Professor Lynn Dawkins and Dr Sharon Cox. Um, and we're really delighted to be leading the East of England recruitment to this trial, which is recruiting an incredibly vulnerable and, and hard to reach population. But there's still loads more work to do um, to support people to stop smoking um, and to stay smoke free. So again, in a similar way to our emergency department trial, we've got lots of new ideas. We're planning on intervening in other clinical settings, um, offering e-cigarettes and smoking cessation support for people awaiting elective surgery and supporting them to stay smoke free after their operation. Um, we are going to be targeting people, particularly living in coastal communities, these communities suffering some of the worst health outcomes um, in our society. And then, of course, we have um, the Love My Lungs intervention, which unfortunately we haven't been successful in applying for funding for as yet, but we're not going to give up a really important intervention that we hope to see um, trialled in neonatal intensive care units in the future. So final conclusions. 
Harm reduction, it's a pragmatic, person-centred approach and is inherently social, as I hope I've shown through, through the, the tour through my work. There's so much work still to be done in reducing the harm from tobacco smoking. Particularly, we need to focus most of our efforts on vulnerable populations, those um, targeting those suffering inequalities, um, aiming to prevent relapse is critically important, and also important, continuing to promote the harm reduction message and demote media um, mis misperceptions of e-cigarettes and other harm reduction approaches. So I just want to say thank you to my amazing, lovely family um, for all your encouragement, support, endless fun, um, complete craziness. Especially thank you to my husband, Marco, for putting up with me, giving me those critical pep talks um, and always believing in me. Um, and a final thank you, of course, to the funders of our work, um, the amazing colleagues I work with in the Addictions Research Group, all the wonderful colleagues, friends, students and mentors that I have um, had the pleasure to work with and will continue to work with. And I know I haven't included everyone on this slide, so I'm really, really sorry that I haven't. Um, I really wanted to do my best to acknowledge each and every one of you. But some of you are incredibly hard to find on social media, so I just have drawn a blank with some people. So I think it was my dad and my brother who yesterday told me that no one ever listens to more than 20 minutes of a lecture. So thank you so much for staying with me, um, and I will be quiet at this point. Thank you for an absolutely wonderful lecture. That was a model of clarity. And, and, and what it really shows, I think, is if you ask very clear questions about very important problems and address them in an appropriate way, you can really make a difference. And, and I think that came through so strongly. Your promotion was richly deserved but I'm afraid to say it still won't get you up the front of the plane. <laughs> <laughs> but with that, I'd like to give the audience the opportunity to ask any questions, and also any questions online as well, if they could be relayed through to us. Perhaps I could start. I confess I hadn't really thought about the particulates in tobacco smoke as a cause of harm. I haven't thought about it enough. But I'm very aware of the research around diesel fumes and the particulates in diesel fumes causing high blood pressure and cardiovascular disease. I mean, are we talking about the same size of particles, these microparticles in tobacco smoke? Yes. Um, Why don't I give you a microphone? There we go. <laughs> Um, yes, you, you're absolutely right. And in fact, there's been some really interesting research that's been done on um, open fires um, within houses and the, the particulate matter that's taken into the lungs as a result of that. And it's an emerging field. It's not my particular area of expertise, um, but we're, we're becoming much more kind of cognizant of the evidence around um, particulates and particularly the effect that those individual particulates have on changes within cells that go on to cause cancer. Mm. Thank you. Um, I'll relay that back for our people online. The, the question was, why, why do we think that the media continues to um, report misperceptions um, around um, e-cigarettes? I think the media love a story, um, and so when there's um, evidence of harm from kind of individual cases, perhaps, that where perhaps the person has been using an e-cigarette just before their admission to hospital, the media kind of jump on those stories. Um, and it makes a really amazing headline, that vaping as bad as fags headline in the sun, as you know, you know, it really catches the attention. Um, and that makes a much better news story than a headline that says, you know, it's much less harmful to use e-cigarettes, even though that's what the evidence tells us. So I think a lot of it is about, you know, the media wanting to sell their product, unfortunately. And just to follow on from that, it's like you, you mentioned research in, is, is more prevalent in the discovery. Vaping was definitely maybe 
one of those wonder things. It's like, um, did, did you, are you thinking about evidence? It's <laughs> all right, Finish. I'll relay it back. Do you, do you think there's evidence being for discovery and the use of e cigarettes down the line? So the question was about whether um, the funding, you know, being biased more perhaps towards the discovery end of science um, has biased e-cigarette research because e-cigarettes were in fact a discovery. Well, I think one of the key things with e-cigarettes is that they're a consumer product. Mm -hmm. So they've been discovered by the general population and they're enormously effective and people like them, perhaps because they're a consumer product. They're not a medicinal product. We still don't have a prescribable um, e-cigarette. So perhaps research funding um, in, in terms of discovery in that way ha has been quite limited by that. And I think there is still a concern about e-cigarettes because they are a consumer product and because they don't have that medical seal of, of approval. But definitely, and I think Charles will probably support me on this, that the, research, the weight of research funding to public health interventions is, is much lower than kind of um, basic science um, discovery and treatment. Thanks for a really great talk. Um, when you're developing, you know, complex interventions like this, it, how important is it to be setting specific? Because I guess e-cigarettes are a great example of something that's just been taken up in in all communities, or maybe it's not, and, and maybe there's some communities that still aren't aren't sort of taking up. So, you know, how important is it to to sort of know your setting, and then how does that make it challenging to roll out, you know, these new interventions? Yeah, um, it's a great question. I think setting um, is really important um, and really influences people's behaviours. So um, to develop interventions that have the most impact, you um, need interventions that can be targeted towards particular settings in some occasions, such as the work we're doing with the neonatal intensive care unit, where you need very targeted approach that's specific to that population. Um, and then wider rollout of interventions needs to be able to account um, for that setting and, and for the real world kind of ways in which things change um, across settings. So something like e-cigarettes um, are really important, but they are variable, and that's one of the important aspects of them. They're not one thing. There's not a one-size-fits-all. There's so many different products and devices and flavours and strengths and different setups. And that's really important because they can be tailored to particular individuals within particular settings um, to have um, the best and uh, the, the greatest impact ultimately. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. A question here. Was it my question? Yeah. Okay. Thanks so much, Caitlin. Um, such fantastic, innovative work as. Uh, as we've come to uh, expect from you. Um, just forwarding, sort of carrying on from that question, I just wondered whether where heated tobacco products might sort of slot into this, and particularly given what you just said about e-cigarettes being no one thing, mm. do you sort of foresee that heated tobacco products might sort of start to muddy the harm reduction waters? Um, I think that heated tobacco products have a place, as is my personal view. Um, heated tobacco products such as the ICOS, we I don't really see them generally used so much in this country, but they are really um, commonly used in Japan and starting to be used in other countries um, across the EU. They are a way of kind of vaporising or superheating tobacco, um, so they don't involve the combustion and therefore much less harmful than cigarette smoking, but they do, all, but they do contain tobacco. So there are still some toxicants, particles um, within the tobacco that will be um, inhaled through the vapour. So I think they're on that harm continuum somewhere in the middle. They probably pose some harm to health, less harm than combusted tobacco, but probably a bit more harm than e-cigarettes than e and prescribed nicotine replacement products. One of the big kind of issues with heated tobacco products is that they are generally produced by the tobacco industry. Obviously, in our field of work, anything to do with the tobacco industry is, you know, a complete no-go. Um, so there's very little research on heated tobacco products apart from from the industry because most independent researchers, you know, um, are very wary of doing anything that, that is working basically with the tobacco industry. 
but there's a big debate about you know what the role of industry in, in harm reduction and, and we see you know in other areas of health you know diet industry for example that industry does have a role to play the problem with the tobacco industry is that it has an extremely bad reputation <laughs> um, and no one no one really wants to engage with them because of that Thank you. Amazing lecture, brilliant, amazing work. And it was lovely to see the history and how it all evolved. So congratulations, brilliant. So my question is about e-cigarettes as prescription. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on that? So again, it's sort of controversial topic within the field. Um, I, my personal perspective, I do think there would be a role for e-cigarettes on prescription. Um, I mean, the work we're doing in clinical settings has been amazing, I think, in, in breaking down some misperceptions of, of doctors um, and, and healthcare professionals um, about supporting people to use e-cigarettes. But there's still a lot of concern from healthcare professionals about whether they should be encouraging people to use e-cigarettes, um, despite the evidence that they're much less harmful. So if we had a prescribed product, you know, doctors could really feel confident this is something they could offer their patients. Um, and I think for some populations, having the um, authority of a doctor recommending or prescribing you something is really important. You know, despite the evidence that we do our very, very best to communicate, there are many populations who are worried about using e-cigarettes. So they can't continue to smoke tobacco because they've heard bad things about e-cigarettes. So if, if doctors were able to prescribe a product, particularly for those really concerned or hardened um, smokers who are very suspicious, then I, I do think that there would be a role in, in prescribed products, yeah. But not for everyone, because some people really like the fact that they are a consumed product and they have encouraged many people to quit smoking completely outside of, of the medical model. And some doctors even are sceptical about e-cigarettes and don't consider them to be less harmful than smoking, so that, I guess, might help that yeah, I think it would give some doctors much more confidence in them. But, you know, I have to say, I, I find it really disheartening that some doctors are still concerned about e-cigarettes or, or see them as potentially as, as harmful, because we have over 10 years now of really quite good evidence. And it's, harm redu it's a harm reduction approach. No one is saying that these are completely safe products, but we know that they are much less harmful. Um, and doctors, you know, have a, a really important role to play in promoting um, health behaviour. And so it's worrying that many doctors aren't able to take this weight of evidence and, and incorporate that into the, the advice they give their patients. Some doctors, not all. Well, hopefully they'll be exposed to lectures of the clarity of the one you've just given, <laughs> for which very many thanks. And all I'd like to do now is close this inaugural and invite everybody to soft or other drinks outside. Thank you.